Hi there, my name is Stephen Shepherd. I'm a consultant in intensive care and anaesthetics working at Bart's Health and I'm here today to talk to you how to do a basic assessment of an intensive care patient. Um, the first thing to say is you are not on your own. Uh, we have a clear plan to support people who are less experienced within intensive care in the management of such patients. But what we'd like to do is give you a framework in order to uh, allow you to function as if you are a first day intensive care SHO walking into their first shift. Today though, as I say, we're gonna concentrate on assessment of the critically ill. And today I'm gonna to talk you through a systems by systems approach with integration of information from clinical examination, physiological parameters that you may see measured, and also data from laboratory and other tests. First thing to say is, um, with all intensive care patients, you need to make sure that you've performed appropriate personal protective equipment and that you've decontaminated your hands. So for the sake of this procedure, we're going to use a uh, kind of pair of gloves and a penny, but this will depend upon the infection status of the patient. So we're gonna start off with talking through the respiratory system. So um, with respiratory system, I'm going to include assessment of the airway. So with intensive care patients, you may find that patients are intubated. So here we have an endotracheal tube, which is a place in the mouth. They may have a tracheostomy, which again, we're not anticipating that you will be expected to manage in any great detail, or they may be spontaneously breathing. With an ET tube, you'll see that it's put in and there are markings down the side. Um, it's important not to assume that just because something is there, particularly when it comes to the airway, that it's necessarily in the right place. And you should always start off by checking that it is where you left it. So you can see here that at the teeth, it's 24 centimetres. And if I ask my nursing colleague, if I could just ask on the chart where it was documented that it was left. So it was documented 24 centimetres. Okay, so I'm happy that the tube is not moved. Also, when I look at the tube, can I see misting? that would imply it's within the trachea. And if I look at the sheen, which again, there's a separate session on monitoring, at the bottom we'll see that there is a number, which currently reads around four, that is the end tidal CO2. That essentially is a measurement coming from here of gas exhaled, and that only comes from your, stomach, uh, from your lungs. You don't get CO2 from your stomach. Therefore, we can be reassured that the tube is in the right place. So. I'm going to move on to the rest of the respiratory assessment and this is going to follow a look, listen, feel type of approach. So it's important to look, stand back at the patient. So I can see this patient is on a ventilator. I need to look at the chest and see whether or not there is symmetrical chest rise. I'm going to look and see if there are any drains and here we have a chest drain and look and see whether or not it's in the right place, whether it's swinging. Um, and also look and see if there's any asymmetry or any injury which might suggest something like a, uh, a kind of rib fracture or similar. But the majority of cases, we won't anticipate anything like that. Um, I'm going to have a look and I'm going to have a feel. And I'm going to feel for chest expansion. I'm also going to be able to, with that, feel for secretions. So patients who have purulent secretions, you can feel those and you can feel rattling. And again, here we have an inline suction. It's really important with the coronavirus patients that we avoid inadvertent disconnection. And so using this suction catheter, we're able to pass it into the trachea and suction secretions by pressing this and pulling. You can have a look at them, see if they are green or unpleasant, which might suggest infection, or if they're frothy and white, which you might find in uh, pulmonary edema. Um, similarly, you can percuss the chest. It's quite difficult in intensive care patients, to and it's not a high yield approach, but you should percuss both sides in the mid clavicular line and then at the lung bases, looking for dullness or uh, accessory infusion or resonance stress of a pneumothorax. As part of that, you should also feel the trachea and see if it's central. Again, pneumothorax is a risk with mechanical ventilation, so if there's deviation away from one side, you should tailor the rest of your examination findings to include or exclude whether a pneumothorax is present. Um, similarly, I'm then gonna move on to auscultation. Again, we're trying to avoid unnecessary auscultation of the chest where uh, patients are coronaviruses, but again, patients on intensive care on a ventilator can develop bronchospasm, so you may hear wheeze, and they could also have present with for other reasons, so pneumonia or uh, effusions related to heart failure. So again, I want to listen in the anterior chest, 
in every lung zone and down at the lung bases. And again, expose the patient to do this. Ask your nursing colleagues to help. We wouldn't necessarily roll to listen on the posterior part of the chest if the patient is recumbent, but listen to the areas that you can get to. I can also start and look at the ventilator and I can see here that uh, this patient is on 50% oxygen. I can see looking at the monitor that that's giving me sats of 96%. And I can also see looking at the screen that this patient's on a pressure control mode. I can also see what tidal volume they're getting. Again, you're not expected to understand these values but you're able to get a sense of how much oxygen the patient's needing and then by liaising with your nursing colleagues what the trend is of that. Trends are far more useful in intensive care than absolute values. So again, I can see they're on 50 to 10 oxygen. Can you tell me what their most recent blood gas is? So the blood gas from today at 2 o'clock shows a PCO2 of 5.6 and a PAO2 of 9.8 with a pH of 7.37. Okay, so again, we'll talk through the appropriate physiological parameters here, but I'm happy that someone is achieving a SAT of 95 and a PO2 in general above 8. What's important though is he's on 50%. What's the trend for his FiO2? So uh, actually we've been increasing for the last three hours. Okay, so again the fact that the oxygen requirement has gone up may suggest deterioration and again that may be progression of the condition that brought them in or it may be a new problem and again your examination will help tailor that. The next thing I'm going to talk through is cardiovascular examination and again this kind of follows it look, listen, feel. Uh, important again to look at the patient. Do they look uh, peripherally shut down? Do they look mottled in their arms or in their legs? So expose the patient and have a see. Have a feel. Are they warm to touch? Which would imply either a vasodilated situation, such as sepsis, but a good cardiac output. Patients in whom there is a low cardiac output or who in cardiac shock may be cool peripherally, they may be clammy, and they may have a prolonged capillary refill. You should measure capillary refill peripherally, but you should also measure it centrally. And you do that by pressing on the chest and you hold that for five seconds before releasing and counting the duration of time it takes for the blood to refill into the blanched area. That is, can be really helpful as an assessment of both cardiac output and filling status. You move up the arm so you feel peripherally, you move to the chest, you look at the heart rate and patients on intensive care will have usually continuous ECG monitoring. And I can see there I've got a heart rate of 48. That seems quite slow, but actually normal is not normal in intensive care. And if I look at the red line below, which is an invasive arterial line, I can see that I have a blood pressure of around 120 on 50. So actually I've got a good blood pressure despite being a little bit slow which may be because of sedation or maybe because of administration of other medication. I'll be able to get a better sense of that as I continue on. Um, feel for the heart. Have a feel for whether the um, apex beat is displaced, which might suggest congestive failure, and have a listen to the heart sounds. Again, these can be difficult to hear over the ventilator, but they can be helpful if there's a change. So if you have normal heart sounds and then you develop a murmur, that may be an indication to ask for more specialist tests or for a review. And again, it's important to highlight to the intensive care consultant who will be supporting you through this process. Um, have a little feel of the rest of them. Have a feel of the legs. Feel for the peripheral pulses. And also look and see if the patient is significantly edematous. This may represent congestive failure, but actually critical illness induces a leaky state. So patients often become significantly edematous and actually that may be a sign that you may need to look at their fluid balance, which we'll talk later on. Again, trying to integrate the information that we've got, we are seeing that we've got a blood pressure which is adequate, but it's important to know what we're doing to achieve that blood pressure. And I can see here this patient is on some infusions, one of which is a drug called noradrenaline and one of which is a drug called vasopressin, which are both drugs that are used to support the peripheral circulation. Again, you want to know what the trend is. So if I could ask what, what, what dose of noradrenaline are we on? So and dose, is it going up or down? The dose is uh, 0.1 mics per kilo per minute and it's unchanged in the same with vasopressin. Okay. So again, we are 
going to provide you with information about what kind of the expected dose ranges are for many of the drugs that we use in intensive care. But we can be reassured that that level of support isn't going up. And again, if we look at the trends on the, on the um, blood pressure chart, we can see that actually this patient's blood pressure has been stable over that period. So although his FiO2 has gone up, his degree of cardiovascular support hasn't changed. I can also ask about some of the results of tests, so in particular blood gases, and the thing that I really would be interested in is the lactate. So if you could tell me what that is. So the lactate from 2 o'clock is 1.6. Okay, so a normal lactate is less than 2. Um, lactate is a marker of essentially your body switching to uh, anaerobic metabolism or a sign that perhaps you aren't getting enough perfusion to your peripheral tissues. The fact that it's normal suggests that we've got reasonable peripheral perfusion and therefore a reasonable cardiac output. Okay. Um, also important to notice as well, are, as well as any vasoactive medication to support the blood pressure, have there been any rhythm problems? So although this patient's relatively slow, atrial fibrillation is very common, particularly in sepsis and intensive care. And so look at the rhythm section of the chart and see whether or not you've had any episodes of that. And similarly, whether you've needed any antiarrhythmic medication. So moving on to uh, neurology. Uh, so uh, the next kind of most important system for me is the brain. So within intensive care, you'll find essentially one of three, three situations. You'll have a patient who's awake, you'll have a patient who's sedated, or you'll have a patient who is sedated and paralyzed or on an infusion of medication to prevent their muscles from working. And that's very frequently performed in patients who've got ARDS because it is a uh, intervention that actually is helpful in reducing the period of time that a patient needs to be on a ventilator. So you need to make an assessment of their conscious level if they are not on medication that is sedative or paralyzing and their degree of sedation uh, if they are. And you do this in the same way you would many things. So hello, Mr. Jones, how are you keeping? So look to response to voice. If that doesn't respond, look to response of stimulation, uh, gentle stimulation, and look to see if the patient moves. But actually he's not. And again, I can see that this patient is on some sedation. So if I look at the chart, I can see that the patient is currently on propofol and fentanyl, um, both of which are uh, drugs that are used commonly within intensive care, both for sedation and analgesia. We use an analgesic-based strategy, so we tend to have patients on infusions of an opiate or similar because we want to preempt pain. And again, this needs to be titrated to effect. So there are various scales used, but essentially the one that you most commonly use will be the RAS score. This runs from negative five to plus four. Essentially, negative five, deeply sedated, but also paralyzed, plus four, a patient who's very agitated and distressed. In general, for most patients who aren't paralyzed, we target this at around zero, which is someone who is comfortable, compliant, and cooperative, um, or in patients who are on a ventilator on significant amounts of ventilatory support, we'd want them to be more towards the negative range. Again, you'll be guided by your intensive care colleagues. Um, I also have a look in the pupils, so I want to check that the pupils are reacting to light and whether they're symmetrical. Um, there are certain specialist neuromonitoring kind of requirements. You again are not expected to know much about these, but it is useful to have some assessment of kind of tone. So what do the arms feel like? And again, the same with the legs. What do the legs feel like? In general, you will not require a full systematic neurological uh, investigation, except in specialist units, um, but you can make some assessment of clonus and also plantus and that can be helpful because in patients who are mistated you may find that actually they um, have developed an intracerebral event and therefore they uh, the, the only clue that you may find is that they are um, have a change in tone or a change in reflex um, so the next system I'm going to examine is the gastrointestinal system so uh, Patients may have gastrointestinal problems either as part of their presentation or they may develop them whilst on intensive care. 
Um, abdominal examination is helpful, but can be quite limited in patients who are sedated. So again, we're going to follow a look, listen, feel approach. So I'm going to expose the patient while making sure that I keep them dignified. And again, I'm looking for scars. I'm looking for distension. I'm looking for stomas. I'm also going to look and see if the patient is jaundiced clinically. Um, again, this can be quite difficult in patients on intensive care. And you may find that actually you're relying more on blood tests. So looking, I can also see that this patient is being fed nasogastrically. And here we have a tube connected to an enteral feeding set. And this patient is continuously fed uh, whilst they're sedated and ventilated. It's important to make an assessment as well of how well that's working. So uh, you need to look at usually what's called a gastric residual. The way you do that is the nurses aspirate an NG tube, usually somewhere in the region of every four hours. If the volume that they get is less than around 250 to 300 mils, they would consider that to be absorbing and therefore return the feed and continue feeding as appropriate. And we generally aim for around one or two stools a day. Most patients will require regular laxatives to be administered in order to do this. I'm feeling for tenderness, I'm feeling for masses, um, I'm also feeling for distension. Patients who are on an infusion of paralysis will not develop guarding because their muscles will not be able to contract, but they may still have percussion tenderness. Moving on to gas GU, uh, I can see that this patient is not attached to a dialysis machine and I can see that there's a catheter in place and it will be documented on the chart as to what their fluid balance is. So over 24 hours it's negative one litre, mm -hmm. and over the last three hours it's 670 mils in total. By now I should have got some information to start and allow me to make an assessment of where I think their fluid balance is. So uh, I have some idea about their hemodynamics because I've looked at their blood pressure, their pulse, how much support they are requiring, but also get an assessment about what their filling status is and whether they're edematous. Um, you are not expected to manage haemofiltration or dialysis. Those are more specialist areas of, of management and you'll be guided by nephrology or intensive care colleagues in those patients. Um, but it's important to notice if a patient is receiving ongoing haemofiltration and what kind of the fluid balance has been over the past two to three days. It's also important to ask or note if a patient has previously or recently been on haemofiltration. If it's off, you get an idea about how their renal recovery has gone and whether they're continuing to pass urine off that level of support. Moving on from GU, we're going to move on to haematology. Anemia is quite frequent within intensive care and we often accept very different values to ones that you might expect with an award patient. So again, this is a discussion uh, on the ward as to what haemoglobin target to get. It's important to look for any overt signs of blood loss. The need for transfusion is quite frequent within intensive care. A drop or change in your platelet count is very common within intensive care and can have many reasons, which include sepsis or include activation of blood that's going through artificial machines. Um, discuss with your uh, intensive care colleagues about what target they want and whether you will need to support this. Similarly, anticoagulation. So most patients on intensive care should have thromboprophylaxis following local guidelines. Most patients will have TEDs in place or Floatrons or compression devices where those are unsuitable. So the last three things that I want to think about are firstly haematology, then infection and lines. So haematology, it's important to ask what the current haemoglobin is, uh, make some assessment about whether that's been stable, and also what the current platelet and uh, clotting profiles represent and how they fit with the day's targets. If there are any abnormalities, it's important to try and assess why they might be there. Similarly for infection, um, what's the temperature and what's the trend been over the past 24 hours? What antimicrobials are patients prescribed and what day? and what's the trend in their inflammatory markers such as white cell count and CRP. Again, look for common sources such as the chest, such as diarrhea, such as uh, infection of the urinary tract. Um, but actually, and this falls to our last point, lines are a particular source of contamination and therefore it's important to assess the uh, cleanliness uh, and whether lines are appropriately uh, dressed and stitched but also whether they're still needed and take away any bits of plastic uh, following the ward round and discussion that you no longer need. A assessment then includes a, assessment, a, a review of the drug chart 
The last thing is to give your patient a, a fast hug or a fast hug BID. Um, this is a, a mnemonic that's used to try and uh, ensure that you don't miss some of the basic things which we know make a significant difference to outcome. A lot of these patients will have very similar physiology. They will be vasodilated and they will have a pneumonitis causing hypoxia. But one of the big things that changes outcome in intensive care is avoiding secondary injury. In particular, acquired infection, DVTs or inadequate feeding. So fast hug comprises a number of reminders just to check that you haven't missed anything as part of your assessment. We've covered a large number of these, but I'm going to go through them again. So F is for feeding. So is the patient being fed? How? Is it working? Are they absorbing? And if they're not being fed, why not? Do you need to go another route, such as parental nutrition? A is for analgesia. Is the patient appropriately comfortable? We can see here this patient's on an infusion of fentanyl to keep them comfortable. But in patients who are awake, make sure you consider whether or not they need simple analgesia such as paracetamol or stronger um, medication as in discussion with uh, a member of the intensive care team. S is for sedation. So it's important to note what sedation they're on, how deeply sedated they are, but also ask the team every day, should the patient have a uh, sedation break? Again, this will be led by your consultant um, and they will advise you whether or not it's appropriate at this time for the patient to be woken briefly or even sedation to be ceased. But it's a prompt to remind. T for fast is thromboprophylaxis. H is for head up 30 degrees. So you can see that this patient is not flat on their back. We've tilted them up. Um, in doing so, we're hoping to improve the compliance of the lung at their bases. U is for ulcer prophylaxis. Last G is for glucose. Uh, and so you will find that a large number of patients on intensive care are on infusions of ACT rapid or insulin in order to maintain a blood sugar of somewhere around four to 12. BID, so we've got a fast tug BID. First B is for, well, the B is for bowels. Um, have they opened them today? Are they on appropriate uh, laxatives or appearance? I, invasive devices, which again I've discussed. Can we take anything out? Is everything clean? Is everything working? And the last one is for de-escalation of antibiotics. And so wherever we can, we should in com conversation with our microbiology colleagues, aim to get the right drug for the right patient. That's the end of this session. Thank you.